All right. A few closing remarks, and then uh, please do uh, go to the networking event, uh, aka Beer and Wine. Uh, we'd uh, love to host you there. It is part of the SNIA's uh, way of thanking you for making sure that we uh, had a great Persistent Memory Summit. So let me wrap this up and thank our sponsors again. I hope all of you went out and took a look at the sponsors displays on the tables and whatnot and the running systems. They're really great stuff. Uh, uh, in, again, uh, thanks to the underwriters Intel and the uh, SSSI from SNEA. Uh, had several speakers from those two underwriters. And then again, all the, all the demonstrators, the Giga and Google Cloud. Thank Google Cloud for sponsoring the hackathon. Uh, Open Fabrics Alliance Smart and Viking. All right, we did have persistent fun today and we had, uh, as I asked you, we had a metric boatload of really, really good sessions. Uh, and uh, we will ask certainly uh, uh, you for your feedback uh, on all the sessions, but uh, I thought we did a very good job. I'm a little biased, of course, but I still thought we did a really good job uh, of that. And lots of different topics as well uh, here today. Now, let's, let's set the Wayback Machine to 1963. First of all, can you identify the persistent memory module on the top? There is a hint on the slide, by the way. That is a ferrite core memory module. It is a whopping 32 bits by 32 bits. So that would be 1,024 bits if you do the multiplication. That's 1K bit of ferrite core. And I did uh, actually uh, the photographer there. So you, you can literally count and you can almost see with the naked eye what's going on. Guess what? That is a form of persistent memory. Circa early 1960s. Right, ferrite core. Ferrite core really didn't go away until yeah, early 80s. Depends on who you ask, but that's about right. And then, can you identify the machine in the picture? There is a hint in the picture. That's right. That is a control data 6600. The two main designers of that machine were Seymour Cray. He was actually the second designer. The first designer was a guy named Jim Thornton. Read his book. Dated 1970, and it talks about the architecture of this groundbreaking, fantastic machine. And I will admit to writing code for that machine. Right? I, again, I turned 40 next year, hexadecimal. I wrote code for that machine as a 20-something. And it was, it was the best machine in the world for a long, long time. And it had actually two tiers of persistent memory. Later on, the, the successor to that, the 7600, actually had a large disaggregated memory. Anybody familiar with that? This is back to the future, people, right? A lot of large disaggregated, called large core memory, LCM, right? As opposed to SCM, system central memory. But they enforced in hardware the single writer, multiple reader concept because you could hook four 7600s together into this large core memory uh, with each independent channels. And they had that all figured out. 1968, they had that figured out, right? So I love all the work in persistent memory, but if you're not quite hexadecimal 40, persistent memory actually existed in the distant past. We used it, we programmed to it, and by the way, somebody mentioned uh, the, the dilemma of restarting or rebooting a system with persistent memory. We had two choices on that machine. There was literally a switch that said dead start, right? And if you hit the dead start switch, Right? You literally zeroed out memory from zero to, actually the, the limit was 262K words. A word was 60 bits in this machine. Not 64, 60. 60 is an interesting number. Evenly divisible by 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Go figure. Right? So it zeroed out memory. That was called a dead start. And then you read from tape and the OS came in and off you went. As opposed to a warm start, which did not zero out memory. It left it intact, so you could pick up from where you left off before. Right? No, no, you had to know what you're doing on a warm start, but that was part of it. So here's the past. Everybody should be familiar with this. We've been living with this for a long time, and you have probably seen a hundred variations of this slide, some of which you saw today. Right? 
So we lived with this design, with processor and down a bus and a relatively underpowered rotating disk. We lived with that for the better part of three decades. Right? And now we all understand why your database runs so goddamn slow. It's because of this. This is 100,000. That's five orders of magnitude, if you're counting, difference between the latency up here and the latency down here. So if you miss, you go down here and you pay a 100,000x penalty for doing so. Right? So I, I, I talked about this at FMS a couple times ago. So I, uh, when, I, when I come here, and especially at the Hyatt and Convention Center, I stay down at the Santa Clara Marriott. I'm a Marriott kind of guy. You know, you're one or the other, right? So I'm a Marriott guy. So I walk up here. It took about eh, 15 to 20 minutes. Now, it used to take 15 more like 20 now because I'm almost hex 40, so what the hell. But and it takes me, and it's about one mile. Right now, if I stayed at the hotel hard drive, that would be 100,000 miles away, and it would take me 2 million minutes, 100,000 times 20, to walk that distance. Now you know why this architecture didn't work very well. At the time, we didn't care because even just having a rotating disk was pretty cool, but beat the hell out of rotating drum, right? So that was good. It's four times around the world. Uh, yeah, it's uh, not quite halfway to the moon. So I don't want to stay at the hotel hard drive. So this is kind of where we're at today. So we have NVDIMS on the channel, and we have all sorts of fun NVMe SSDs, and they're great, and maybe 10 microseconds latency on a really good day. Uh, and then you have other types of SSDs, and you still have your friend the rotating disk. So now this gap in here, and again, people have talked about the gap. It's only a 100-fold gap. Really better than this, still 100 times. Right, so you miss up here, you go down the bus and you fetch from NVMe SSD and life is good. Ten microseconds later, you get some data. Awesome. Right, you're still paying a hundredfold penalty. Now you know why we want to do persistent memory because somebody mentioned von Neumann. You recognize that diagram? You learned it in Computer Science 101. Right, he taught us this in the late 40s. Right? And still to this day, this is how most machines work. I will not go into a dissertation on the Micron Autonoma processor. You don't want to hear it. And it's not this. Right? So anyway, but we still do this. So the whole game is to keep data in memory, isn't it? Because if data is not in memory, don't you love the phrase in memory computing? I have news for you. If your data isn't in memory, you're not computing. Are you? At least in this architecture. You're waiting. Now, storage is good. There is, there is many benefits to storing data, but stored data in these outside worlds, the world of peripherals, does not affect computation. You've got to read it into memory first. So this is why I'm a big fan of persistent memory, because if the data is already there, it's great. It's there. You can compute against it. Right? It's like, Doc, it hurts when I do that. Don't do that. So here's where we need to be. And again, there's all sorts of different forms. I have a, the cute little slide that I stole from my Micron days, and you can recognize what that is. And now we're getting, we're, we're almost there. Somewhere between 2 and 20, if you miss up here. Right now, there are other technologies that might make that more like between 1 and 2. That's really interesting. Because right, it is, uh, let's face it, it is all about computation. Data is wonderful and we can manage it or try to and all that, but at the end of the day, we've got to compute something using this data. Otherwise, it's just data. And the storage salesmen are really happy, but it's just data. Right, it's just bits. Right, what's the joke? Everything is a zero, one, all the rest are duplicates. It's true. Think about it. So anyway, but it, my, one of my claims here is I think this will go to order zero. There will be order zero of this stuff in a system here pretty quick. Right? And order lots of, you know, 10 terabytes of persistent memory. This is per system, right, or per socket if we get the sockets to pay attention. And then maybe order single digit terabytes of this stuff. Right? Can we please make a socket with 32 memory channels, please? Please, please. It would be really good with persistent memory if I had 32 channels. Think about it. Okay. Because why this persistent memory fun? Because electric light 
did not come about through the continuous improvement of candles. Right? So this is not like our friends in dynamic memory. Persistent memory is a very old thing, but yet it is very new. It is very, very new. And we had to do a lot of this. We had to invent a lot of light bulbs to get there and learn the lessons. OK, so this is it. Right? I hope the summit was good for you. Right? Like, was it good for you? OK. How was it? Right? So we want to hear from you. We the SNEA, right? SNEA hat on now. We want to hear from you about this. Obviously, you've been to a bazillion conferences. I have, too. There are always something we can do better. Right? So tell us about that. But also tell us what we did well. I think that's super helpful. And above all, again, a big thanks to all of you. Uh, we had wonderful speakers. Wonderful content, I think. I hope you think that, too. Uh, but this event doesn't happen without the audience. So I want to thank you, the audience. A lot of you hung in there for every single session, which was great. Really appreciate it. So go forth, have a beer, have a wine. Thank you.